What a great crowd. My name is Kathleen Neal. I am the Senior Director of Policy and Partnerships here at Maine Conservation Voters and Maine Conservation Alliance. Our organizations represent more than 13,000 members and supporters dedicated to protecting Maine's environment and our democracy. MCA does that through education, collaboration, and advocacy, and MCV by influencing public policy, holding politicians accountable, and winning elections. One of the absolute best things that I get to do in this role is to facilitate Maine's Environmental Priorities Coalition. Since 2004, the EPC has brought people together to protect Maine's land, water, and wildlife, to tackle climate change, to advance environmental justice, and to build healthy and sustainable communities through collective action and legislative advocacy. Today, the Environmental Priorities Coalition includes 37 environmental, public health, conservation, and climate action organizations. You see all these organizations on the screen, they are large and small, national, statewide, and local, and together we represent more than 120,000 Maine people who want to protect the good health, good jobs, and quality of life that our environment provides. I wish we had time for each of these incredible organizations to introduce themselves and their work today. I hope everyone's had a chance to introduce themselves in the chat, and I promise that everyone who registered for this program will receive a follow-up email later today with contact information for all of the EPC members. We do have a tight agenda today, so a few technical details before we dive in. You are all muted, but we do wanna hear from you and you can send those questions directly to me through the chat. We'll compile questions for from all of those chats for our Q&A session at the end. And if you have any technical difficulties today, you can message Will Sedlak, he will help you out. This event is being recorded and the video will be posted on our website later this afternoon, also on YouTube. And you'll get an email with the link as well as a bunch of other resources to help you take action to support our shared priorities. All right, now for the good stuff. Each year, the EPC identifies a slate of priority bills that will have the greatest impact in protecting Maine's environment, public health, and climate future. These are not the only bills that our organizations work on and track and support and celebrate, but they do represent our best collective opportunities to advance climate action, further environmental justice, protect biodiversity in our environment, and cultivate healthy, sustainable Maine communities. This year, the EPC agenda includes seven priority bills. Together, we need to recognize tribal sovereignty, advance environmental justice for all Maine people, foster a responsible offshore wind energy from wind industry for Maine, conserve endangered and threatened species habitat, secure the future of Maine's forests, invest in Maine trails statewide, and establish environmental rights for all for generations. Now at this point, none of our bills have been printed yet, which means we don't have LD numbers. LD stands for legislative documents and LD numbers are the best way to track a bill's status. Bills get assigned an LD when they are printed by the revisor's office, and that takes a while. So you can count on us to share those LD numbers, status updates, and opportunities for action as these bills work their way through the legislature. First, you probably want to hear some more details about them. And we are honored to have legislative sponsors or spokespeople with us today to address each of the EPC's priority bills. They'll walk us through the issues their bills address and the solutions they propose. And then we'll follow up later this afternoon with a link to fact sheets that have a bunch more information. So don't worry about trying to remember it all. All right, 
Our first speaker today is Chief Kirk Francis. Chief Francis is the elected chief of the Penobscot Nation and will share about the movement to recognize the inherent rights and sovereign powers of the Wabanaki Nations. Chief Francis, thank you so much for joining us. Yes, thank you for having me. And it's great to see everybody. And um, on behalf of the nation, it's always an honor to, um, to talk about these issues. And also um, thank you all for prioritizing this conversation. I think it's uh, extremely important, not only to um, the rights of the tribe, but um, what's important to I think all of us on this call is, is the um, ongoing management of our land and natural resources to make sure that um, we're operating in a way that's not only sustainable, but um, takes into account the health and welfare of not only Indian people in this state, but um, but all Mainers. And so um, just uh, three or four minutes on sovereignty is, is, is kind of a tight window, but we'll, we'll, um, we'll blast through it. I, I think, um, and I'm sorry if I'm distracted, but I keep getting a, a, a hit to let people in. And if I'm running this, we're going to have real problems today. But I, I, um, I do appreciate, again, the opportunity. I'm in my sixth term as tribal chief, just recently reelected. Um, and have been working on these sovereignty-based efforts, both um, in the state of Maine with a lot of the great members of the legislature we have, and um, as well as members of the United States Congress. So um, a few years ago, um, we were coming off probably uh, four years of some of the toughest times we've had in our relationship with the state of Maine. After 200 years of uh, sitting in the Maine state legislature, uh, Penobscot Nation, Passamaquoddy Tribe, uh, decided that that no longer was um, the most beneficial way for us to approach our government-to-government -government relationship. And today, uh, many of you know Ambassador Mullion Dana, who serves as our first ambassador. Um, so coming off that, uh, the Speaker of the House at the time, Sarah Gideon, uh, President of the Senate, Troy Jackson, and others, uh, Rachel Talbot Ross and um, called us in and said, look, we, we would like to renew this conversation. Um, after a lot of reluctancy at first, um, everybody sat down, started to work through what, what that conversation would look like in the coming years. And of course, the task force was developed and we started to um, started to work on uh, tribal sovereignty issues, what that means for not only tribal people, but what it meant for the state, all of those things. After about a two year process, there were several recommendations passed by the Judiciary Committee, which led us to the past session, which um, had a multitude of bills, including 1626, the sweeping kind of sovereignty bill, um, 585, which was a taxation, online gaming, and its consultation bill, Passamaquoddy drinking water, um, a whole host of things. So we made tremendous progress. Um, over 1,700 uh, pieces of testimony um, in that on those efforts uh, from Maine citizens, over 100 organizations represent thousands of Mainers and tremendous support in both chambers of the Maine legislature. Um, of course, you know, we faced obstacles um, with the administration and the executive office, um, but uh, we're able to get some real accomplishments and we're really you know, um, pleased with those and appreciative that we were able to, to do that. Um, you know, recently a Harvard report was released um, and I don't know if everybody's been privileged to read that, um, which really talks about, you know, the, the lack of um, recognition of sovereignty in Maine as tribes have been restored their rights um, decades ago and over the last uh, 50 years since self-determination uh, Maine has lagged far behind um, in that area, uh, basically keeping tribes in this state locked in, in 1980. So, um, so that should be made clear that this, this whole effort really is a restoration effort. You know, we were granted by the courts um, in the mid 1970s, uh, full sovereign authority over our lands, resources, and people. Um, the 1980 Settlement Act, um, really um, upended a lot of that from a jurisdictional standpoint and has made it really challenging to the point where the tribes of Maine have not been able to 
benefit from uh, over 150 uh, beneficial laws passed um, by Congress over that time for Indian tribes, everything from Violence Against Women Act, Indian Health Care Improvement, uh, Stafford Act for Emergency Disaster Relief, a whole host of issues, um, treatment of state and water quality standards, all kinds of um, things that are beneficial not to only to us from an authority standpoint, but for the benefit of our people in maintaining our cultural identity. So, um, so we've been really pleased over the past few years with our, with our relationships, with our growth in this area, with, um, with the kind of paradigm shift in, in how the state of Maine citizens and, um, and tribal people are now interacting and it's been um, really uplifting. So, um, you know, last year, as you know, um, led by uh, Congressman Jared Golden and Representative Pingree, we um, were able to um, get a bill passed through the House of Representatives and the United States Congress that recognized the tribes of Maine um, as being eligible for uh, laws passed by Congress. Um, they would apply in Maine as it stands right now. Um, those laws do not apply if they have an effect on state jurisdiction. And so um, very vague term, very difficult to overcome. Took us nine years um, to overcome the Violence Against Women Act, um, even though the Penobscot Nation was chosen as a pilot program for that when it was rolled out, one of three tribes in the country um, that was objected to in DOJ chose to go with, other, with another tribe. So we, um, and, and that cost the tribe and surrounding area millions of dollars in services and, and program dollars. So, so there's a real life effect of these things. It's not just some regaining or flexing of muscle. It's really about um, curing a condition from healthcare disparities to um, wildlife and natural resource protection, cultural resources, um, and a whole host of other things that um, that the tribes lag far behind, including um, economics. So, so again, um, the outpouring of support has been great. Um, and uh, we're gonna continue that effort. Uh, we've had some great meetings um, right now with not only um, uh, several uh, members of the legislature that are clearly our friends and champions, but now have engaged um, the GOP as well. And at a recent event, we had about 21 members of their caucus at it, including the minority leader that are really starting to look at this, I think, as, as not a partisan issue, but more of a policy issue in this state in terms of how we want to have our relationship with, uh, with our Native American nader, neighbors. Um, we all understand we're in a coexistence society. We share these resources. We have a whole host of um, issues we have to address together. Many of them are the same. Um, but at the end of the day, all we're really trying to say is that we want the unique and distinct culture of this state that has been here for thousands of years um, to continue to be recognized and be allowed to be self-governed in a way that assures that that's here for a very long time. And so so with that, I'm going to, um, as you can probably tell, I could go on all day, but I, I just wanted to most of all say thank you and um, thank you for your support. We'll need your ongoing support. Um, you know, we had resistance in the United States Senate, as you know, and, um, and we still have some challenges with the executive. So if there's anything anybody asks, what can we do? Um, I think it's just to keep saying this is not about um, what the people of Maine want anymore. It's really an institutional problem at this point, and we need to demand um, on both sides that we're better at, at moving forward and, uh, and making sure that we're restoring these things to a place that uh, makes all of Maine more productive as the Harvard report, as the Suffolk report, as the at loggerhead report, as the multitude of studies have shown, um, we all suffer when we're mired in this, um, this kind of uh, paradigm that exists right now. So, so thank you for having me. Uh, I am totally happy to answer any questions. And I'm sorry if my voice is a little, uh, I'm a little under the weather today, but it's, it's great to see you all. 
Thank you so much, Chief Francis. We are really honored to have to have you with us today. And you know, this is this is the third year that the Tribal Sovereignty Bill has been an EPC priority, and we will um, we're honored to stand with you, and we will continue to stand with you in the Wabanaki Nations. Uh, maybe Will can drop in the the chat right now the link to the Wabanaki Alliance, which has all of those resources that, that Chief Francis mentioned and, and reports, and they're also linked in the fact sheet that you'll get uh, later on this afternoon. So again, thank you. You're welcome. The next priority that we're gonna talk about comes from Representative Maggie O'Neill, who has the, uh, the distinction of being the sponsor of two of our EPC bills this year. She's gonna walk us through the proposal for the Forest Advisory Board. Rep Representative O'Neill, I will turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Kathleen. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to talk with you about these ideas. So the bill I'm going to talk about is called the Forest Advisory Board. And the real goal is to facilitate stakeholder input about forest policy in Maine and bring a diverse group of people together to think about our needs, um, both in the present and going forward in the future. Um, and we're honored that this bill has been named a, an EPC priority, so thank you. So let's start with the significance of um, Maine's forest. You know that Maine is the most forested state in the country at 17.5 million acres. Um, we also know that our forests are crucial for our economy. We have an $8.5 billion forest products economy and a $2.8 billion recreation economy. Something about camping, hiking, canoeing, hunting, et cetera. Our forests are also essential for cleaning our air and our water and for protecting biodiversity and mitigating climate change. Maine forest is actually a globally important resource Geographically, we are situated at the heart of the Acadian Northern Appalachian Forest, which happens to be the largest and most intact temperate forest in North America. And that's really important um, for us for two reasons. It helps to, the first reason is that it helps to mitigate climate change and its impacts. Our forest absorbs 60% of our state's greenhouse gas emissions each year, and studies show that um, they could do even more. And our forests could also help species adapt to climate change. If we properly steward this resource, it could provide habitat for species um, to retreat as climate shifts. And the second big reason I wanna talk about is the parallel crisis of biodiversity loss. You know that uh, biodiversity is the variety of organisms that live and work together in ecosystems. And it's a, really a delicate balance that maintains and supports life on earth and it's greatly at risk. Two examples are that um, since 1970, North America has lost 3 billion birds and worldwide our insect population has dropped 40%. And here in Maine, um, our forests are home to the largest globally important bird area in the United States. It acts as a migration corridor for birds as they travel between their winter and their summer homes. We're also home to many rare plants and animals, including 139 species in the Western Mountains alone. And our forests are um, our, fi our final strongholds for Atlantic salmon, Arctic char, and native brook trout. And all of those species rely on clear, cold water that is shaded and filtered by the forest. You also know, um, that our forests are facing challenges, including drought, fires, insects, and disease. Um, our forest products industry faces changing markets, shorter, shorter logging seasons, and competition. And we're also seeing unprecedented development pressure and dramatic shifts in land ownership patterns. The data shows that we're losing 10,000 acres of forests every year to development. So these are the big reasons why it's so important for us to work on this bill. And what the Forest Advisory Board is going to do is it will create a stakeholder group that will bring together diverse perspectives and expertise. And um, those folks are going to advise our state's forest service on challenges that threaten the future of Maine forests. 
It'll be a range of people from landowners to loggers to sports people to biologists, um, tribal representatives, and conservationists. Most folks will meet publicly each year to take stock of forest policy, monitor trends and conditions, and to make um, recommendations to the agency and to the legislature. These kinds of groups are a common sense approach. Um, there are 15 other forested states, including neighboring New Hampshire, who have this kind of public forest advisory board. And across Maine government, we have 90 plus similar advisory bodies. So it's a proven strategy to encourage communication and cooperation and to engage public input. I really appreciate your time and, and support, and I'd be happy to answer any questions at the end. Thanks. Thank you so much, Representative. We will hear about your other EPC priority bill in just a moment, but first we're gonna to turn to Brian Hubble, who is joining us from the Office of Speaker of the House, Rachel Talbot Ross. And Brian is gonna walk us through the speaker's proposal to advance environmental justice in Maine. Brian. Thank you very much, Kathleen. It's great to be here. And, and uh, yeah, my name is Brian Hubble. I'm a policy advisor for Speaker Talbot Ross. The speaker regrets that she can't be here in person. She's got a conflicting meeting and on, and but she is very grateful for EPC's support and this really important topic of environmental justice. As, as those of you on this call are well aware, this is this is not a new legislative initiative. This is part of an ongoing process. You will remember in the last session, I'm sure, uh, there was there was originally LD 1682 sponsored by Representative Dudera, uh, which led to a committee bill that came out in the second session, ENR, which proposed um, uh, both granting process for intervener status at the PUC and also proposed new regulatory system at the Department of Environmental Protection that would better incorporate uh, the, the concerns and voices of the environmental justice community. Unfortunately, at the end of uh, last session, in the, in the, I guess simply because of the volume of bills that were on the appropriations table, that part of the bill uh, didn't make it into final enactment. Um, and so our, our concern at this point is that we continue the effort where that le left off last session to provide important capacity across state agencies, particularly at DEP, for all these permitting processes to make sure that the interests of environmental justice are not only understood at the state agency level, but are, are, are meaningfully ad ad adopted to include those goals. Um, in the meantime, um, as, as, as I said, we're, the bill is under still under development because a number of things have happened since then. While that's our threshold uh, to, to start where LD 2018 left off, we're eagerly looking forward to the report of the Equity Subcommittee, Maine's Climate Council. Again, many of you are familiar with this final report. We're actually expecting next week. Uh, and we, we hope and expect that the content from that re report will further direct, I think, the course of the speaker's bill this, this session. Um, Beyond that, uh, you will remember the speaker last session had another bill, LD 1610, which directed the state economists to build better demographic information uh, for the state. Remains one of the speaker's top concerns that anything that we do in this area has to be meaningful to the particular communities in the state and within the state. And so we're hoping that that builds better policy as well. The third component, um, not a component of this legislation, but it, as, as you're well aware, there's tremendous opportunity represented by federal funds coming from uh, the uh, 
federal infrastructure bill and uh, and and other federal initiatives and that which are now being governed by executive direction from the president for uh, it's called the Justice 40 uh, uh, requirements for dis distribution of those funds. We are particularly eager to make sure that what Maine does in this area of environmental justice is aligned to best capitalize on those funds as well. Uh, so I, uh, a long way around to say we, we are grateful for EPC's support and focus on this issue. We think it's gonna be important, particularly given we are slightly disappointed with where LD 2018 landed last session to keep the advocacy through the appropriations process because we are we understand that again for meaningful change to happen in, in this area that we need to build state capacity. Um, we are looking forward not only to informing the content of the bill with this uh, equity subcommittee's recommendation, but also to the committee discussion that surely will follow, which will be presumably well fed by advocacy uh, from, from the environmental alliances supporting this. So we, we look forward to all of that and we'll continue to be engaged. I assure you this is, a, this is an important issue for the speaker. And once again, thank you for inviting us. Uh, let's call on. Thanks so much, Brian, and thanks for all of your work in, in moving this forward um, over, over the last few years. You know, like the Tribal Sovereignty Bill, the environmental justice work has been an EPC priority for the last couple of years, and we'll just keep uh, keep chipping away at it. So we will um, look forward to, to keeping continuing that partnership. Next up, we're going to talk about the another EPC priority, and I'm going to turn it over to Kelt Wilska, who is the Energy Justice Manager here at Maine Conservation Voters. Kelt is going to introduce Senator Mark Lawrence's proposal to foster a responsible offshore wind industry here in Maine. Take it away, Kelt. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here today. Um, my name, as Kathleen said, is Kelt Wilska, and I am the Energy Justice Manager at Maine Conservation Voters. I serve on behalf of MCV as the Maine State Lead for the New England for Offshore Wind Coalition in support of regional advocacy efforts. And on the state level, I work to facilitate a robust partnership between environmental and labor groups in support of responsible and equitable offshore wind development in the Gulf of Maine that will benefit all Mainers from the coast to our most rural inland communities. I'm here today to talk about a new bill to create an offshore wind industry for Maine, an industry that will strengthen Maine's economy, provide good paying jobs for Mainers, reduce energy price volatility, and continue our progress in addressing climate change, all while lifting up our most vulnerable communities in the process. Our dependence on fossil fuels is already having an impact on Maine. Climate change and extreme weather are already affecting our communities and the energy price spikes and volatility that too many Maine families are struggling with right now are entirely due to high and unpredictable prices for oil and natural gas. But we have a chance to jumpstart a new industry that will employ Maine workers and use technology developed at the University of Maine to tap some of the strongest and most consistent winds in the world right here in the Gulf of Maine. This bill builds on the work of Maine's offshore wind roadmap, which has involved a broad group of stakeholders, including from the fishing industry, business groups, environmental advocates, scientists, and energy experts, organized labor, state agency, the University of Maine, and many others. The list can go on and on, led by the governor's energy office. This bill sets clear targets and a procurement schedule for offshore wind, which will catalyze interest from the private sector and spur the kind of investments needed for infrastructure, supply chain, and workforce development. But this bill goes further. Since any offshore wind development in Maine will happen far offshore in federal waters, this bill is Maine's chance to put our stamp on how this industry develops and get it right from the outset. That's why we're setting high standards for labor, equity, and the environment right up front. The stakes are high. The need to move away from fossil fuels for climate and economic reasons is urgent but we must also ensure that offshore wind in the Gulf of Maine is developed responsibly using the best available data and scientific research to inform siting, construction, and operations. 
I'm delighted to say that Senator Mark Lawrence, as Kathleen mentioned, um, will be sponsoring this bill. He is the chair of the Senate Energy Utilities and Technology Committee. We are thrilled to have his leadership in guiding this bill through the legislative process, along with the steadfast support of the Environmental Priorities Coalition. The deep partnership between environmental and labor groups working towards the mutual goal of responsible and equitable offshore wind development is reflected in the truly intersectional nature of this legislation. With this science-based approach, we can ensure that offshore wind, wildlife, fishing, and other activities all coexist in the Gulf of Maine as we bring clean energy to our region, stabilize long-term energy prices, and ensure that the benefits of this promising new industry are distributed equitably throughout our entire state. So thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer any questions when the time comes. Thanks so much, Kelt. This has been a big week for the offshore wind bill. There was a, a press conference earlier this week. Some of you may have seen it in the news. So thank you for, for giving us some more details about it. Next up is Eliza Donahue. Eliza is the Director of Advocacy at Maine Audubon, and she is here with us to share Representative Lori Gramlich's proposal to conserve endangered and threatened species habitat in Maine. Eliza, you're up. Great. Thanks so much, Kathleen. I'm, I'm so pleased to have the opportunity to introduce this bill to everyone. I'm, I'm unfortunately Representative Gramlich um, from Old Orchard Beach. She has a, a prior commitment today. So, uh, you know, Kathleen alluded to the subject of this bill, um, and I'll tell you that it has a very specific purpose and a very long name. It is an act to include endangered and threatened species habitat in the definition of significant wildlife habitat under the Natural Resources Protection Act. But please set that name aside. It can be really confusing, even though it's totally accurate. So the purpose of this bill, the purpose is to create a vital yet presently absent policy tool for the protection of endangered and threatened species habitat. Earlier, Representative O'Neill talked about the biodiversity crisis, which I have no doubt this audience is well aware of, but to kind of uh, hit that point home even more, scientists predict that on our current trajectory of habitat loss, <clears throat> excuse me, and global warming, nearly 40% of all species will face extinction by the end of this century. And Maine is no exception. In fact, this legislative session, Maine's Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife has recommended that the legislature add eight new species to the Maine Endangered Species Act, including salt marsh sparrow, thick nails thrush, tricolored bat, and uh, a type of bumblebee. The department's even considering adding more and very soon. So as I said, habitat loss and habitat degradation is a, or really depending on how you slice it, it's the leading cause of wildlife population decline and species loss. And Maine has a fair amount of policy tools to address the loss or degradation of endangered and threatened species habitat, but it does not require that the majority of environmental permits issued by the state for new development consider or mitigate impacts to those habitats. This is a gaping policy hole. Incremental habitat loss, you know, one poorly sited driveway or septic system at a time can have a big impact on vulnerable species. Species that are really on the brink where every population and, and often every individual really counts. So this bill would close that gaping hole that I talked about and require that permitters consider impacts to endangered and threatened species habitat and mitigate those impacts when necessary. And the good news is, is that often really small modifications to how and when specific projects or developments are designed or built can have very favorable outcomes for vulnerable species in the area of that development. Um, while still allowing that development to proceed, it's really extremely rare for a permit to be denied. And more often, permitters will require or recommend, for instance, that construction happen at a specific time of year, for instance, to avoid breeding season, 
or that building footprints be shifted to another location within a lot or maybe a particular size culvert be used when building roads. These are really reasonable measures that are extremely beneficial for wildlife. And I'll, I'll close by saying, and I say this without hyperbole, that this is the most meaningful legislation for endangered and threatened species that I've ever worked on. And I've been doing this for a long time. And I'm, I'm really honored that my colleagues at the Environmental Priorities Coalition, and I hope now all of you uh, have also recognized the importance of this bill and will join me in advocating for its passage. Thank you so much, Eliza. I really appreciate that. Next, we will hear from Pete Didesheim. Pete is the Senior Director of Advocacy at Natural Resources Council of Maine, and he is here to walk us through Representative Jess Fay's Maine Trails Bond and what it can do for outdoor recreation and active transportation. Pete, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thanks, Kathleen, and thanks everybody for joining this. Uh, Representative Fay extends her regrets that she was not able to deliver these remarks, so she's asked me to do so. So I'm going to channel my inner uh, Jessica Fay, who's a Democrat from Raymond on the Appropriations Committee. I'll channel her in sharing these, which are her remarks. So I'm pleased to be sponsoring the Maine Trails Bond, a bill that would provide $30 million over a four-year period to support the design, development, and maintenance of trails statewide. Let me first thank the 37 organizations that comprise the Environmental Priorities Coalition and also the Maine Trails Coalition for supporting the bill. And when the bill is printed and more people learn about it, I'm confident that towns, trail groups, and businesses across the state will be interested in supporting it because there literally are current and potential future trails in every corner of this state. Maine has the potential to be a top tier state in the nation with multi-use trails that support our economy, environment, and quality of life. Over the past few years, more people than ever have discovered Maine trails for hiking, biking, snowmobiling, skiing, commuting, and other activities. And this heightened level of trail use also has shown us that we have a large backlog of maintenance projects, and there are a large and growing list of exciting new trail projects that Maine people support statewide. Many communities have identified new trail opportunities for active transportation trails that will help reduce our dependence on fossil fuels. We also know that more investment is needed for trails that are accessible to individuals across all abilities. Trails currently are a critical part of the nature-oriented infrastructure that supports Maine's $3 billion annual recreation economy and its 41,000 jobs. Snowmobiling alone generates $460 million in direct spending across the state and supports 2,200 jobs. Existing funding sources are falling far short of what's needed to make Maine the nationally recognized destination for trails that it could be. This bill will provide grants to nonprofits, municipalities, and others to support non-motorized, motorized, and multi-use trails spread over a four-year period, as I mentioned, managed through the Bureau of Parks and Lands. In closing, I really believe that this bond holds tremendous promise for elevating the importance of our trails as a key feature of our state for connecting Maine people and visitors with the natural world, linking communities and providing recreation and transportation options that contribute to our health and well-being. Thanks. Glad to answer any questions later in the program. Thank you, Pete. I really appreciate that. We have made it to our last priority of the uh, of the day, the Pine Tree Amendment. It is sponsored by Representative Maggie O'Neill. But rather than pulling her back up here, we're going to turn to one of the original advocates of the so-called Green Amendments, Maya Van Rossum. Maya, thanks for joining us, and the floor is yours. Thank you so very much for having me. It's really um, been an honor to be part of the collaboration that's advancing the Maine's version of a green amendment, which is called the Maine Pine Tree Amendment. And it's been an honor to work with Representative Maggie O'Neill and Senator Rick Bennett to advance this really powerful protection. In Maine, environmental protection, like every other state across our nation, is really left to an inherently flawed political system 
where pollution and environmental degradation are too often seen as political bargaining chips, or they become the subject of a pu public comment process where regulators and industry have far greater leverage in, in determining the final outcome than the people do. And as a result, Maine's environmental laws too often are focused on legalizing environmental pollution and degradation through a system of standards, reviews, and permits, rather than being focused from the get-go on prevention of harm for it's also a system where, unfortunately, environmental racism is alive and well, leaving BIPOC and low-income communities to suffer disproportionate environmental harm. And it's a system where gaps and loopholes leave serious contaminants, environmentally degrading activities, and industrial operations all too often unaddressed. And when these laws, as written and implemented, result in unacceptable harm, often there's not much that impacted communities can do because it's all quite legal. By contrast, the Pine Tree Amendment will provide an overarching constitutional obligation that will transform this system. It will create an obligation on all government officials at every level of government to recognize and protect the inalienable rights of all people to a clean, safe, and healthy environment. It will refocus all government officials on prevention of environmental harm first, rather than hopping to the end of the process where the focus is on legalizing harm through permitting. The Pine Tree Amendment will ensure that all government action, whether officials are legislating, regulating, permitting, whatever they're doing, that, that all these actions protects the environmental rights of all the people and the state's natural resources equitably, regardless of race, ethnicity, or socioeconomics. And when there is not equitable protection, the Constitution can be utilized now to help secure a remedy. The Pine Tree Amendment will also create an obligation to protect the environment so future generations can benefit from and enjoy the many bounties of healthy nature. In short, the Pine Tree Amendment will lift up environmental rights to the same highest constitutional standing as we give to other fundamental rights, like speech and religious freedom. We all know how powerfully these kind of fundamental rights are protected. Well, now the environment will be given the same highest regard and protection. And just as with other fundamental rights, the Pine Tree Amendment creates a system where ultimate power actually lies with the people. So when government acts in a way that infringes on environmental rights, people will now be entitled to seek judicial intervention to remedy unconstitutional levels of harm. The Pine Tree Amendment will strengthen how existing laws on the books are interpreted and applied because now they must be utilized to advance the obligation to protect environmental rights. It will create a positive foundation for new laws and better government decisions, and it will fill the gaps in needed protection where they exist. The Pine Tree Amendment will also transform advocacy and activism, making people feel more empowered because now they won't just be fighting for the environments and the communities they love, but they will also be fighting for a constitutional entitlement. And government officials will feel more obliged to listen to environmental advocates because they have taken an oath to uphold the Constitution, which now will include the secured environmental rights of all the people. The main Pine Tree Amendment will provide powerful protection in its own right, but it will also be incredible value added to every other priority that has been presented today. I really believe in the transformational pathway for environmental protection that the Pine Tree Amendment will provide, and I thank you for the opportunity to share my message. Thank you, Maya. Your, your passion for this issue is inspiring. Uh, so there's obviously a lot more to say about each of these bills. And later on this afternoon, every member of the legislature and everyone who registered for this event will get a follow-up email with links to the EPC website, where you'll find fact sheets on each of these priority bills. Those fact sheets have a lot more information and they also have contact info for the EPC members who are leading each of these campaigns. Specifically for lawmakers, we are counting on your support. Thank goodness we are able to offer legislative briefings at the State House again this year. We had intended to uh, introduce this agenda to you yesterday, but the weather had different plans. Never, never worry about that. We have lots of different ways to stay in touch now. 
And you should already have received a schedule for the in-person legislative briefings that the EPC has scheduled. Don't worry, we will remind you. Um, stay tuned, reach out to me, reach out to the EPC leads at any point. Thank you for being our partners in advancing this agenda. Now for the public, this agenda is only going to move if you take action. You can count on Maine Conservation and all of our EPC partners to keep you posted on the status of these priorities and the opportunities to take action. That could be offering testimony, could be writing letters to the editor, could be reaching out directly to your lawmakers. You will receive the very first action alert of the session this afternoon with a link to pledge action on all of these priority bills. So please click through, follow that, and we will keep you posted from there. Oh my goodness, we always want to have more time than we do. But we have a few more minutes and we've got a few questions. So if you have questions, you can send those to me through the chat and we will get started with this one. Um, this one, this first question is for Brian Hubble on the environmental justice bill. Brian, could you tell us a little bit about how this legislation may approach defining environmental justice communities. What kind of criteria are we talking about? How do we figure that out? Um, that's an excellent question. Um, uh, and uh, we, the speaker is depending, I think, a good deal on, as I said, the recommendations of the equity subcommittee, which has been working on that question diligently for the past year. Uh, I, I, I want to add to that, that the speaker is also particularly concerned that those definitions are meaningful for Maine's communities. Uh, this is an effort that's been engaged in different communities across the country in many different ways, and we've learned a lot from that. Uh, so we are particularly interested in understanding how those definitions actually impact and make for meaningful change in terms of environmental regulations. So uh, as I said, we're, we're looking forward to the uh, report from the equity subcommittee to understand that better and to the discussion, which certainly will follow in the Environment and Natural Resources Committee in relation to this bill as it goes forward. So thank you for the question. Seems like the that question of how we define environmental justice communities, that is, that's the whole the whole ball of wax there. So thank you for <laughs> giving us that that insight into how we'll work together to uh, to tackle that. Have a uh, a question from someone who noticed that we are we're talking about a couple of different bills, both the environmental justice bill and the tribal sovereignty bill, uh, that that this coalition has championed in the past and is is working on again. Uh, I know the the EJ bill that you just talked about, Brian, is is a little bit different in each of the years, you know, so it's not exactly the same legislation, but curious about what changes the prospects um, and what changes our strategy for getting it across the finish line when, when we're taking another bite at the apple. Um, I'm not sure I have the last word on that, that one. Uh, I, I, I want to emphasize that the speaker is committed to actually moving something forward this session that is I mean, successful. Uh, and because of that, I think it's really important that we make sure that it, A, as I mentioned before, fits the needs of Maine's communities, but also capitalizes and leverages this other set of resources that we have before us. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of impetus by intention uh, from the federal government to align along here. Tremendous amount of work, as I said, been done in relation to Justice 40. Uh, we believe, I think, that we are further along in that process and that the, and we've established, better established the state's commitment to making that happen. And I'm gonna, I, I, I really wanna give a particular shout out or 
give credit to uh, this the, the past several years worth of work in the Maine Climate Council which, as you well know, it established this as one of the priorities for Maine's climate action plan. Um, I think a lot of foundational work has been done in that area. And I, I hope and trust that you will see further action at the state level as a result of this interest and in drive. Um, I'm not going to characterize where I think we're gonna end up because of it, but I am, fairly confident we're gonna move this, this time around with, again, the help of, of the broad alliance of environmental advocates to continue this. The, these are always long pushes, you well understand. Uh, so we're, we're, we're committed. I'm not sure quite where that's gonna take us, but we're committed to, to this, this session. Well, that counts for a lot, and you've got a, a lot of people on this uh, on this call and beyond that that are are with us, and that that works. So thank you, um, Eliza. I have a question for you about the endangered and and threatened species habitat, Bill. Will how do we make sure that that adding this level of protection doesn't slow down the the process or or is that something that we don't need to worry about? How will it be integrated into the current process? Yeah, that's a great question, Kathleen. And, and I think that it's really important um, as environmental advocates to recognize that while, uh, maybe I'll speak for Maine Audubon, while we are ultimately advocates for, for wildlife and wildlife habitat, we're also people on this earth um, that are facing a housing crisis, for instance, in, in Maine, that um, there are some real uh, important infrastructure development needs that our state and the nation are speak are facing. So it's really important as we're thinking about developing these natural resource protections that we're also making sure that they're balanced against um, some real present needs. I have a lot of confidence that this bill um, is going to strike that balance um, because it, it's making a change to an existing law, our Natural Resources Protection Act, um, that has demonstrated that that balance can be achieved, that there can be um, mitigation measures put in place that allow that, uh, development to go forward um, with some modifications where those modifications are due. You know, some of the examples um, that I talked about and are definitely worth repeating are, it's often as simple as saying, you know what, <clears throat> the septic system for this house that's being proposed It'd be much better if it was on the north side because we see that there's this wetland on on the south side or you know what let's make the culvert x inches in diameter instead of y inches in diameter because that will allow this endangered turtle to pass under the road that is being um, proposed to be constructed so i think that we're able to um, achieve that balance and a lot of important decision making will be uh, in the hands of our Department of Environmental Protection and, and also in the hands of our Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife, who also have a really strong interest in maintaining that balance, again, of protecting our natural resources um, without uh, slowing down progress. Those are really, really helpful um, examples. And thank you for, for reiterating them. It is just uh, fascinating to hear that, you know, it's, we're talking about tweaks more often than we're talking about you know, denial of a, of a permit. So that's really helpful. And I love that, that balanced approach. Speaking of balanced approaches, um, a question for you, Pete, about the, the trails bond from someone who's who's wondering how we balance building out trails and our outdoor recreation with conservation and protecting biodiversity. How, how do we make sure that we could, can do both at the same time? So trails in, I believe, play an incredibly important role for connecting people with the natural world and to this place that we love, uh, the state of Maine. And absent creating the opportunities that are accessible to people of all abilities to enjoy the natural world, they can't learn to love the natural world and they won't be protectors of the natural world through the variety of approaches that come before them for 
funding land for maize future through other policy measures for the purpose of protecting nature. So I, I really believe that our trails, and we've seen this through the pandemic, our campgrounds, our state parks, our trails, people are going to those. And I believe they will continue to uh, connect with the natural world through trails. And we really need to understand that Maine has this extraordinary opportunity to be probably a top tier state in the entire Eastern United States because of our trails. But we need to treat them as something that deserves investment and care and stewardship and not just volunteers trying to, to, to keep them from eroding away. Thank you so much, Pete. And uh, a shout out to all the volunteers who are doing <laughs> that good work. And, and this is our, our way of, of paying, paying back and saying, yes, we're gonna give you the resources that you need to do that important work. Um, it, we all benefit from it. We all benefit from all of this work and we are so grateful to have all of you with us today as we launch our, our priority agenda for 2023. A very special thanks to our speakers today, Chief Kirk Francis, Representative Maggie O'Neill, Brian Hubble coming from Speaker Rachel Talbot Ross's office, our EPC partners, Kelt Wilska from Maine Conservation Voters, Eliza Donahue from Maine Audubon, Pete Didesheim from NRCM, and Maya Van Rossum from the Pine Tree Amendment Campaign. We are just absolutely delighted and honored to work with all of you. You, thanks to the 37 organizations that make up Envi Maine's Environmental Priorities Coalition. If you're curious about who is running the show at all of those organizations, you will find a link in this afternoon's follow-up email to all of the EPC members and contact information for each. Keep your eyes out for that follow-up email this afternoon. Feel free to forward this recording to anyone and everyone. We need all of us uh, in the, the halls of the State House and the Zoom and YouTube channels of the State House as well. So thank you for your partnership. Have an absolutely wonderful weekend and uh, we will see you out there working for these bills.